him from the Venom GT. It's John Hennessy, and he may have the fastest car in the world. And he's here today on After Drive, and we're going to talk to him for a really long time. You're going to find out everything you need to know about John Hennessy. Stay with us on After Drive. Everything you didn't want to know. <laughs> So welcome to After Drive. We've got John Hennessy here today. You know him from the internet. John, good to see oh, you. Oh, the man. internet, the commander. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You are uh, you're ruling the internet with your with your cars. Man, I'm just trying to cruise along with you guys. I want to figure out where I can get one of these drive oh, jalopnik these are, uh, sweaters, man. That's, these are very rare. Mr. Rogers' uh, Nomex quality would be, you know, I'd be highly <laughs> exactly. proud to wear one of those babies. <laughs> absolutely. Anytime. I'll show you where I got it. Cool. Um, but uh, so you're in town for uh, your yeah. new, it's it's New York Auto Show. New York week. Auto Show, exciting time. Um, you know, some people may know we ran 270 on our Venom GT down at NASA Indeed. a few months ago. And, uh, for that. Um, the folks from uh, Shell Pennzoil, about the same time when we were trying to break a record, uh, came to us and said, "Hey, look, we've got this new oil process where we take natural gas and convert it into a motor oil, and mm -hmm. it's very pure, and we think it'll be great for your cars." We're like. You know, I've been a Mobile One guy my whole life, yeah. my whole adult life, and using all my cars. And I'm like, you know, I mean, I'm open to a new technology. So they kind of came in and their engineers kind of told us you know, why they thought it would benefit the Venom. I'm like, well, we're going out and trying to go 270 plus. It'd be a good idea to have it. And we said, okay, we're trying to go run the car. We may go out to a runway in California. We'd like to go to NASA. And they said, hey, look, you know, we'll supply you with the oil. Uh, and we'd like to help tell your story. And I'm like, uh, okay, well. As long as the, the TV guys are not getting in my way, you know, right. we don't mind having them embedded with us. So we went down, we ended up going down to NASA, and they had a, a, a Bandito Brothers that did Act of Valor sure. uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, with us. The, and, um, the, the film production crew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jacob Rosenberg is one of the main guys. And Anyway, so they wanted to kind of help tell the story about what we did or didn't do or how did we get there and that whole thing. So anyway, we were successful. We got our 270 number. And um, they filmed a one-hour documentary that comes out on National Geographic Channel on May 7th. It's oh, Wednesday fantastic. night, prime yeah. time. And uh, so everybody, a lot of people know that we ran the 270, but, you know, what's the context of trying to break records and what all go really goes into and what's the yeah. real driving thing? What's the passion? What's the, you know, was it, you, you know, like for me, it's like my dad introduced me to cars and, um, you know, I guess maybe in a way for me to, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid, and so to really? kind of get to go to NASA and do that stuff. So, so they're basically telling that story. So they're doing a premiere, uh, breaking barriers tomorrow night at, at Gotham Hall. So that's cool. why we're here. So, how do you get into a NASA facility to do a test? I mean, is it so, you just just go up to them and go, "Hey, yeah, NASA, you know, yeah. let's." Can NASA. We, uh, I mean, NASA is a very cool organization, but there's very still very much a serious, you know, space exploration, you know, new technology mm -hmm. deal, and they're not interested in, in opening up, you know one of the premier runways in the world to, you know, <laughs> SECA event. So right. it took us a while to kind of figure that out. And we'd come in and we'd say, well, hey, you know, we're we'll maybe do this video on, on YouTube or maybe it's on Jalopnik. They didn't care about PR. They're like, hey, we got enough good PR. We don't <laughs> need like, you. We're NASA. We are exactly. PR. Yeah. It's like, uh, if your car goes fast, it's great for you, but we're yeah. NASA. Okay. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, yeah, I get that. And so, um, but they said, look, we do have a provision under the Space Act Agreement where if you're coming in for a scientific test, an aerodynamic test, and you can provide us with a test plan that shows what you're actually trying to learn about what your car's doing. And if you happen to set a record in the process of doing it, that's okay. So John Heinrichsey, who's one of our consulting engineers, who's our chief development engineer in terms of our chassis. For, and formerly of GM, right? Formerly of GM, 38 years with GM, mm -hmm. you know, multiple SCCA national champion and great engineer and all around good guy. I had John, work with John, and we made up a, a proposal to NASA and said, look, yeah, we're not just going out there just to try to run some glory number. We, you, just, you just can't do, just go out there and say, we're going for it. You know, there's yeah. a process and learning the arrow. And we'd already kind of done that several times. And there's a Ellington Field in Houston where we tested, which is 8,000 feet. And we had uh, Matt Farah and the, and the drive guys there yeah. with us for, uh, for a Guinness record where the fastest car is 300 kilometers. Right, which so, we actually have the link to that cool, right here cool, somewhere. Cool. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and uh, um, so, and then we tested at the Navy has got a really awesome uh, runway in California called Lemoore Naval Air Station. Mm -hmm. So 
Navy been very cool and very supportive, but we wanted a little bit longer runway. So the Naval runway in, in Central California is 2.9 miles. We went 265 about a year ago. Right. And I'm like, man, if we just have a little bit more real estate. Because when, when the runway. Veyron guys went the 267.8 and in one direction did 269 and change, they had 5.6 miles to work with. And they've yeah. got banked ovals. Right, and, and you yeah. can't, and no one can use and that anymore. I mean, that's anymore. an awesome home field advantage. If I had my Porsche own six owns mile that truck, place. well, Volkswagen, VAG. Oh, Volkswagen, yeah. And so they ran their number there. They, they have no reason to let me or anybody else in there. <laughs> exactly. Which I totally get that. I have my, my own six mile straight. I'm like, no, I ran the number. You guys could find your own right. place. <laughs> so we also looked at doing, the state of Texas has been very cool. We had a couple opportunities where people have seen maybe some videos where there's a toll road near Austin, SH 130, yeah. that goes by the Formula One track. We ran 220 in a Cadillac there, 204 in a Zeal and Camaro there. And then just last December, the state built a new toll road near Houston where I ran a little over 200 in a C6 VET. Awesome yeah. roads, but just not conducive to 270. The, the, the Grand Parkway near Houston, it's straight, it's fairly flat, but every time there's an intersection with the road that it goes past, it has kind of a hump where it goes over it. And so, especially at those speeds, that would be amplified, I'm sure. Yeah, you're gonna compress when you're going yeah. into the deal, and then you're gonna unload at the top, and then you're gonna compress again, coming off that deal, and I'm like, you know, going 270 is dangerous enough. I mean, yeah. the, one of the biggest uh, fears has always been is that a critter, there's a coyote, there's yeah. a deer, there's a you know possum hitting the nose of a car, a tire at speed, it could be devastating. Yeah. So, you know, it's dangerous stuff. Uh, we felt like the, our driver, uh, myself and my driver felt like you know, a big wide runway, the NASA runway, the shuttle runway is like 300 feet wide, maybe 350 feet wide. Yeah. You've got a lot of room to negotiate if something goes wrong, if there's a problem with the tire, which by the way, the Michelin tires, they're not certified for the speeds that we're running. But we yeah. did our calculation, we did, we did our analysis with John where we knew what our downforces were at each corner, we knew what the load rating was on the tire, so we felt completely fine with that. But again, right. it's because, like- Because as you're going, and, and if, you know, if you're running a, a downforce car like yours, mm -hmm. the faster you go, the more pressure there is pushing down. Yeah, I mean, or that's you can have lift. Of, I mean, you don't know. Or you, so we, yeah, yeah. we did an extensive amount of testing in, in Houston at Ellington Field with, our daughter made it? All right, our daughter made the the the, the Baylor uh, the Baylor cheer team. Mom is All out right. uh, celebrating. <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. You heard it here first. Thank you. Um, Fantastic. So, uh, but no, so so the Michelin guys were great, and we thought the tires were up to the you know the task, but nobody had really tested that tire to that speed. Yeah. So we did our calculations, but that was a concern, but. Um, they, they worked out great. We never had an issue with the tire. But so all these things kind of came into play. But back to your question about how do you get into NASA? So we submitted this whole plan and then just getting down there and going through all the security clearances. We actually went there for the first time in January. Got wow. rained out. We were oh. there for a whole day, flew a whole crew of people in there. We got rained out. So we regrouped. We rescheduled for the second week in February. This time we did two days. We're like, okay, if we get rained out one day, we'll run the next day. Yeah. First day, a front comes through. And there's a 25 mile an hour crosswind. Oh. Couldn't run, and I told Brian, our driver, Brian Smith. He's the uh, he's the uh, the director of Miller Motorsports Park. Great oh, guy. Yeah, right, sure. Runs Miller. Super driver. Just engineer. Mm -hmm. Was a former tire test engineer at Michelin. So. Oh, perfect. And he's Brian's been with us for 10 plus years. Anytime we've done anything significantly fast with the car, Brian's our guy. Right. And so I said to Brian, I'm like, why don't we just make a test run, 200, 220? Even though it's a crosswind, if it gets nasty or the car starts moving. Just shut it down. Well, let's just make sure the cars work and all the telemetry's work and there's no surprises. Yeah. He went out and, and we turned the boost down. We were down from 1244. We put it down on the 1,000 horsepower setting. He ran 253 on a 1,000 horse and he still had run runway to go, wow. but he got out of it because at 245 and a, and a 45 or a 25 mile hour crosswind, the car started moving. Yeah. So he stayed into a little bit more. We're like, okay, the forecast for the next day was looking very, very good. Still a crosswind, but slightly, you know, three to five miles an hour, mm -hmm. and we just went out first run and, and, and nailed the number. And wow. it was, um, it felt really good. We, we we had intended to do a two-way run so we could average it out, which is yeah, you know, that's the Guinness way. That's the way, Guinness, that's the way yeah. any any proper bonnable they'll run both directions. And um, that day on that Friday, we, which was not our primary day, NASA was testing a, an autonomous landing vehicle for a Mars deal called Morpheus. Oh, oh wow. And we got to check at the Morpheus. So we're leaving on the end of the runway where Morpheus is being testing and going the other way. <laughs> oh, that's and cool. so the return run would have meant that we we're coming back towards their $25 million <laughs> spacecraft. So when people say, well, you know, it's not legit because you didn't really run to both directions. We wanted to. Yeah. NASA wanted to let us run both directions. But on that particular day, we could. But right, right. I mean, if you watch the video, I mean, you know, almost 6 million views on YouTube now, you can, the car went from two 
60 to 270 in 10 seconds. It's That's still pulling. significant, yeah. It's still yeah. pulling. I mean, if we had an, I calculated if we had another model to work with, we would have at least gotten another three, maybe another five miles an hour of that car. Right. So, anyway. So, I mean, tell me, you know, I think, you, you know, not to bring up too much criticism, but I think the, the traditional criticism has been that it's a purpose-built car for just going really fast like that. It's kind of like you pulled a couple of things together and, and you know, if, if you've yeah. seen the car up close, you know that that's not right, right. true. Because I think... Well, the, you the, guys gave us quite a compliment. You guys, I think, had the Venom ranked in the top ten of the most controversial cars of all time. Right, I mean, sure. right up there with DeLorean, I'm like, hey, that's pretty cool. It's pretty controversial. It's not a Guinness World Record, but it's pretty damn good. Uh, yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, and and we, don't, we, we don't make any apologize for what the car is, and you're right. It, once somebody's seen the car in person, then whatever preconceived concept or internet commando, you know, <laughs> post that they've seen somewhere about it, just, you know, we just took a Lotus and just put, took out the little Toyota four-banger and just <laughs> got out the torch and the pry bar and wedged in a, right. a, a, a ZR1 engine hey, and Bubba, just like watch this. stuck the Hennessy name <laughs> on there. Yeah, exactly. we think she'll go 270. Just <laughs> right. slap on a couple turbos on there and see what happens, you know? Right, right. Now, it's, it's, way, it's way, way more than that. But we felt like, you know, going back early on, and you know, I don't know if you knew this or not. You know this because you've been with Gelat Mix since day one. So the first idea of the Venom came about after a road track shootout, we actually, one of our twin turbo Vipers beat a Veyron oh, yeah. in a zero to 200 competition. Right, sure. So after that, we thought, okay, what's next? And I figured adding more horsepower is not always the answer. It's a good thing, yeah. but lighter weight with more horsepower would be better. Right. And so we thought, you know, can we build our own car? Can we modify Ford GT? You can only take a couple hundred pounds out of a street car and then it becomes a race car. Yeah. And then it was just a joke. I just joke about, hey, what if we took an Exige or an Elise and we put the twin turbo Viper engine in the back of it? I it's remember that. And I remember that picture. I, when yeah. did you come up with the... Well, with that's, the... That's, that's where you guys come in because uh, I had an artist in, in the UK who done some work for me render it up. And I'm mm. like, man, that looks pretty badass. <laughs> right. And I printed it out and I kind of had it in my little you know, folder at SEMA. And it was just hanging around Barry McGuire's Car Crazy TV thing. Right. And either you or, or Matt or somebody from Jalopnik you know, this is old technology. This is way yeah. before the drive network. Oh, yeah. Just came up with a camera. This is 07? Oh, yeah, so oh, the YouTube like has that. only been around for like a year or two. And somebody came up with a camera and stuck a camera in my face. And it was Jalopnik. I didn't really realize what Jalopnik would grow into. <laughs> but I'm like, but I'm, I'm like, you know, if somebody comes up and says, hey, what's new? I might actually tell you what's new. I'm trying to be more, a little more reserved and not let too many cats out of the bag. Yeah, but yeah. but one, Jalopnik guy says, well, what do you got that's new? And I'm like, well, it just how happens to be your lucky day. And I fact. showed the picture of the car with no media plan, with no intent of publicizing. And it was just a crazy idea. Yeah. You guys went viral with it. And it within, was a crazy within, idea. And it did go viral. Dude, within two weeks, I had a guy from the Middle East, a chief from the Middle East, called me up and says he wants to order the car. I remember that. God, and I'm this like, is, oh, it's shit, funny. what am I going to do now? Yeah, you know, exactly. What am I going to do now? And I thought, <laughs> I well, gotta build the damn you know, thing. I mean, I'm like, okay, I think I'm charging the guy enough money to at least do the development work. Well, by the time we built our prototype and, and delivered his car, I think he paid us a million bucks, and we'd spent three at that oh, point doing it. So, wow. so it's one of those things, you know, I tell my kids all the time, be careful what you wish for. And my right. wife reminds me of that from time to time. Um, but it's really true. But I'm, I'm glad we did it. And Jalopnik was, a, was a, a, an integral part of the Venom being launched, and the guys at Top Gear came along and, and yeah. have given us a lot of nice coverage over the years. So, so for us to be able to go out, I mean, the premise of the car was always to be the fastest, to be the most right. powerful, the lightest. And, and we didn't want to do, we, we're not Koenigsegg, we're not Pagani, you know. Those guys, you know, had bigger budgets, had more, uh, you know, Horatio has a background of, you know, building the 25th anniversary Countach and yeah. kind of the father of carbon fiber in the industry. You know, uh, so before he built his car, he knew how to build cars. We know how to modify cars. We know right. how to modify cars probably better than anybody currently in terms of the breadth of cars that we modify from Lamborghinis to Ferraris to ZL1 Camaros to, you know, hammer wagon uh, Cadillac CTSVs. <laughs> right. And so doing our own car, we felt like, you know, I'd seen what other guys had done trying to build their own car, and I didn't want to be like a guy like Tucker where I just ended up going out of business trying to build my own car. So I thought, right. well, let's just try to modify something, but radically modify it to where when you really dig into the Venom, yeah, it, we use the Lotus cockpit, because I didn't want to waste time and money developing a dash, air conditioning system, wiper blade. You, know, you look at the video, our wiper blade is right, it's not even moving at 270. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, interesting. It's, yeah. really, it's really pretty cool. I mean, I'm sure the, 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 the Lotus engineers probably think, you know, and I think initially <laughs> they thought we were crazy, but I think as we've gone down the road and validated what the car's capable of, I think they're kind of proud of well, what, that's, what we've accomplished. Yeah, that's interesting because, I mean, all these parts had to come together as a whole at some point, right? Right, right, right. right. So, so there is a, 
well, and an there's, amount there's, of there's, development there's, work there's, that has there's, to get there's, done. there's engineering, so we, you know, we use a variety of engineers and contractors to help us do a lot of the CAD. One thing that I don't know people know is we had such a small budget, we did not have the, like, typical manufacturers, they'll, they'll design something, then they'll clay it, and then they'll build a prototype, and then they'll change it, then they'll wind tunnel it, and then they'll build some pre-prototypes, and they'll, they have all these abilities to make multiple changes. Yeah. We barely had the money to design it in the computer, build molds, and build the car. Right. If we got to the built car part and realized that there's some major uh, screw up in the engineering or somebody <laughs> forgot about something or whatever, we did not have the money to go back and change a chassis or do something completely different. I mean, yeah. thankfully, the built car from the, from the computer model to the actual physical piece right. were 95%. And wow. so, but the real work began is after we had the car. It's like, okay, what do we do about the suspension, the brakes, the right. engine, the powertrain, the transmission? And rather than reinvent the wheel, if I can take a Ford Ricardo transmission that runs in a 4GT and I built 50 4GTs with 1,000 plus horsepower, that's the transmission we're going with. Right. You right, know? Right. And so, you know, we, we adapted a lot of stuff that already existed because, again, small budget, short amount of time. I mean, the automotive space is like, things, you know, yeah. things change every 18 months right. in the industry. Right, if you're taking three you know? years, where you got to do 18, 18 months right. is the thing, right? Yeah. You have to build, design, you know, design so like, and build. Well, and, like when and, our, when and our, get it when done our first months. client commissioned the build, maybe six months into the build, he was killed in a helicopter crash. Right. And I his family came that. along and they're like, you know, we don't know if we want to finish the build or cancel the order. And I'm like, I understand either way, you know. And one of his brothers stepped up and said, hey, look, I want to have the car built as a, just as a memorial piece to my brother. Now wow. it's in their own private collection over in Abu Dhabi. Um, that, you know, that it took us from, from crazy idea to a jalopnik guy to the internet to first production car was about two and a half years. And, but we wow. lost. So it was a six, nine month while his family kind of went through their grieving and decided, hey, are we going to build that car? And I'm glad they did. I mean, we yeah. built, we delivered 11 cars so far. We're finishing our 12th, and we have four wow. more on order. So it's pretty that's, cool. That's pretty significant. It's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's pretty it's cool. good. Yeah. Um, so the, what's next? I mean, for that car, are you going to continue to develop that car? You, you're building a new platform? Or what, I mean, I, you, you know, whatever you can you know, tell us I mean, that. Yeah, I mean, as far as the current car, I mean, we, we've spent in the last three, four years, leading up to a validation of a 270. We've got a Guinness record for fastest car to 300K. We're looking at a few other. I mean, it'd be cool to go do a Nürburgring program, but that's, it's, you know, on the other so, side of the pond. Well, so that's, the, you know, the other part of the criticism is that, well, this car can't corner, well, obviously. Well, no, I mean, we've, we've spent a lot of our time validating the straight line stuff, but we took an early customer's car to, uh, to the Goodwood Festival of Speed. We were in the mm, supercar run, right. which is not timed, yeah, yeah. but I, did, I actually kept, and John Heinrich, he was driving for us, but. I mean, we annihilated a lot of the other super. So the car totally gets around a, a road course, and hopefully we'll get an opportunity with a, a Chris Harris or you know a proper uh, you know car analyst driver to, to give a review at a Circuit of the Americas or a, a European track. And so I that think that's coming this year, you know. Yeah. And so that's something that. But I mean, we're, we're we've announced that we're only going to build 29 Venoms. We're we're more than halfway past that fulfillment. You know, could we build uh, a next gener generation or something beyond the current car? It's a possibility, but I'm, I'm just having fun building the current cars, and uh, you know, our clients are having fun with them. Steven Tyler from Aerosmith, yeah, that's is, uh, right. yeah. he travels a lot, he works really hard, but man, when he's in LA or Hollywood, he drives that car every day. He's probably wow. put more miles on his Venom than any other, any wow. other client. Yeah. So he's like his own one-man uh, development team, kind of. He's, well, Steven, if you've done he's his one-man one PR team. I mean, well, basically, true, anytime yeah. he does something with the car, goes somewhere, it's, uh, it makes the news somewhere. Well, how many miles, while well, you were testing it, how many miles do you think you put on it? You know, well, on the very on our very first prototype car, the X1 car, yeah. we put about 3,000 miles on that car in the UK. Now it's it's owned by a collector here in the States, and um, can't really drive it on the street. It's not it's not a US car. It's a Euro, it's a Eurospec car. But I mean, I, you know, the our guy in the Middle East wanted the first car, and then when our other customer came along and said, well, "What do I got to do to get like the first car?" I'm like, "Well, we already built it for a guy." But I'm like. We've got the prototype. I never really thought about selling the prototype. <laughs> right. We made him a deal on the pro He actually owns two cars. Wow. Yeah, and a uh, cool guy, lives out of Florida. And, uh, and so, you know, who knows? I mean, I don't know if at a Barrett-Jackson 50 years from now what a car like that's worth. But to us, I mean, the validations, you know, I mean, there's a lot of cars out there that are cool. There's some awesome cars, the 918, the P1. Yeah, Everybody's well, right now, it's supercar. It seems like there's a supercar renaissance sure. going and on. and those cars are super high-tech where you've got the curve system and the electric stuff and the environmentally friendly and all that, and I'm, I, I dig all that stuff. You know, our deal is, uh, the Venom to me is always about being more of a raw car. Mm -hmm. you know, McLaren F1, 
you know, really F40. I, I really liken the Venom right, to yeah. an F40 times two <laughs> in terms of just that raw visceral experience. And when, when Matt Farah drove uh, Steve and Tyler's car right when we built it, you know, just to see Matt's impression <laughs> and uh, yeah, Matt. You know, uh, Matt was. Um, it's funny because his expression kind of told the story. You can't. You you know. You just can't. It's it's this. That's one thing I love about Drive and Jalopnik because it's real. It's authentic. You cannot. Nobody's buying his expression. It's like when you're <laughs> you know about ready to piss your pants with joy. And from a car experience, Bill Caswell when he's riding up the up the hill at Goodwood right. with John Heinrichsey and he's about to piss himself. <laughs> that's right. And his yeah. eyes are getting all you know big while he's going over the little yump there by the wall. Yeah. Uh, that's. I wish we could share that more with the viewer, the enthusiast. You know, there's only a handful of cars. They're all customer cars or million dollar plus cars. Yeah. And uh, you know, if I could wave my magic wand, I'd love to build a future car that was, you know, eighty percent of the current car at twenty percent of the price. If I could build a, if I could build the same car for the same money as say like a, you know, the new six fifty S McLaren or a, sure. or an Aventador. Like two three hundred thousand. Yeah, right? yeah. But it's just it just in the volumes that we're talking about and being such a small company, yeah. we don't have that type of buying power. And I, I and I do like the the aspect of having the car being very very exclusive. Yeah. So real quick, when's the uh, documentary come out, and, and where? On um, National Geographic. Yeah. So on most cable and uh, you know uh, direct TV channels uh, on Wednesday, May the seventh, I think around uh, nine o'clock Eastern time. So it should be a pretty cool story, cool. and uh, yeah. well, I, I can't wait to see it. Cool. And um, so, any plans to go after it? Guinness, and does it even matter? Okay, all right. Here, just a quick uh, deal on the Guinness thing. So yeah. Guinness, you guys are part of this. You know, you guys, we're kind of intertwined. You know, <laughs> I think so, uh, yeah. good or bad. Um, <laughs> so about a year ago when we went 265, we put the news out and I thought, okay, we didn't beat the Veyron's record, Guinness wasn't even there, and we did not run two directions, but I'm like, our car's faster at 265. The Veyron Supersport, even though the Guinness record's 268.7, right. every Supersport you can buy is limited to 258. Right. 400, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, 400 kilometers per hour. And so, uh, oh no, a little faster than that, 415. Anyway, so uh, I thought, well, our car, honestly, is the fastest car that you can buy. Okay, Veyron goes faster if you take the speed limiter, but they all come with a speed limiter. Right. Okay, so the London Times picked that up and started asking questions. They called somebody Bugatti. And Bugatti's like, well, no, if you come to our special track event, we'll take the limiter off. Right, but not every day. And then they came back to me yeah. and they told me that. I'm like, news to me, that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. That's kind of neat that we help kind of, yeah, you know, sure. uh, generate that little bit of news. And then somehow somebody at the Times called back and got somebody further up the food chain in the PR department at VAG, uh, Bugatti, and they said, well, that's not really true, <laughs> but, the, but, the, but, the, but the five world record edition cars don't have limiters. Right. Anyway, it came, they came to find out that none of that was true, that all the original no, news about the 30 super sports they built were all speed limited to 254 or 258 or whatever it is. Right. And so then they called Guinness. And they said, well, Guinness, did you know that the car that they ran the record with didn't have a speed limit, and your rules say that all cars have to be the same. And Guinness was like, no, so Guinness uh -huh. took the record away from him. Oh, right, How right, insane yeah, is that? Yeah. I mean, it was yeah. never mine. I mean, I have great respect for Bugatti. I think it's an incredible car. The Venom and the Veyron are, the only thing they have in common is they're really fast. The Veyron yeah. is super luxury, comfortable, it's heavy. Venom is more of a very basic road car, yeah. like a GT3 RS, that's really lightweight. It's 2,700 pounds, Veyron's 4,000 plus. So, yeah. so they took the record away. Uh, and, I, and I'm just kind of swirling in the middle of this controversy, and I'm like, hey, look, I'm just going 265 with my car. You guys can figure out the pissing contest of who gets what record and whatever else. I really don't care. Yeah. And then a week later, I would assume after some uh, conversations between the, the, the Volkswagen Bugatti folks and Guinness, Guinness reinstated the record, as they yeah. should have. I mean, they should have never taken the record away in the first place. I mean, yeah, so, I, mean I, have res I have respect for Guinness and for what they do. But they're business, they're a service. I have to pay them, when they came out for the 300 kilometer deal, I had yeah. to pay them a good chunk of money to show up. Right, right. And, and so, so the, the, the point of my story is, is how does it relate to when we went to NASA? So after all that controversy and they took the record away and then they gave the record back, I'm asking them, okay, what are the rules? If I've got to beat the Bugatti guys, what are the rules? They came back with this whole litany of rules that you got to produce 30 cars. Well. When I made the announcement way back when, four years ago, yeah. I said we're going to build 29. So all of a sudden, randomly, they just come <laughs> up like you got to build 30 cars to be a production car. Right, well, right. Well, in my right. world, the Venom is street legal. It's a production series. We build all the cars the same. I've got customers. They're cars that are around the world, and you know you can splice it and dice it in terms of where that fits and 
what you know truly qualifies. You know, if it has a 4 GT transmission, well, is that your definition that it's not a production car? Because guess what, the Veyron has got a VW Golf uh, key fob. That's okay. True, yeah. So I mean, uh, so there are shared components. You yeah. look underneath the Bentley Continental GT, and you see the VW and Audi markings on different pieces. I mean, and that's that's common. It's just the way I mean, it goes. It's just yeah, the way sure. it goes. I mean. Uh, you know the, the the Camaro is uh, is 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 uh, as American as it gets. It's built in Canada with engines from Mexico. Yeah. But it's still you know so I don't get into the whole you know splice and dice and the rules. But when Veyron or when Guinness came back and they said you got to build 30 cars and then the crazy thing is is so you have to go out and and get up to the speed and then you have to average that speed over a flying kilometer six tenths of a mile. Right. Where the hell are you going to go from zero to 270? run another six tenths of a mile, and right. then have room to slow down. Right, right, right. And then do it in both directions. I mean, that's Bonneville type stuff. Yeah. And so I get that whole Bonneville thing, but I asked the, I asked the, the head Guinness guy, why do you do that? And he says, well, that's the way it's always been done. That's the way they did it back in the 20s and 30s. I'm like, dude, they used to use buggy whips back in 1890, okay? <laughs> we don't use buggy whips anymore. GPS is the standard, so what, what does it matter whether we go 270 for 30 feet or 3,000 feet. Right. That, why does yeah, that really matter? And, and from a safety standpoint, I said, dude, you're, just, you're wrong. I go fast for a living. You make rules. I know what's safe and what's not safe. And I said, the longer you're going, those speeds for that distance is more exposure to danger that you're That's you know, true. Yeah, submitted that is to. True. So, so, so to back to the whole Guinness question, maybe if we do a future generation car down the road. I'm, I mean, I said 29 cars, that's it. We will not build any more than 29 Venoms. Yeah. Maybe we do another car down the road that's more, that, that meets Guinness guidelines and we go get that number too. Oh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll see what happens. John Hanson. All right, man. Very good Enjoyed to see it. you. Okay, yeah, you too, Mike. Enjoy uh, New York City. All right, City. man. I'm be looking for my sweater. That's right. I'm going uh, no to build, a, build a, a, a one, one just for you with the drive logo just across the center. All right. Yeah. And, it, and it. it'll go 270 miles an hour. We'll test it out for you. <laughs> exactly. All right, see you later. Thanks, man. Thanks. After drive, we'll see you guys next week.